Hello everyone, it's Mike Lazar here. Welcome back to the channel. And before we begin today's video, I just want to remind you all that I'll be offering a beginner's Byzantine chant course this fall. So if you're interested, the link to sign up is in the description down below. It's going to cover singing technique and Byzantine notation. So in today's video, I want to cover good practice habits for chanters or for musicians. So uh, a couple months ago, I posted a video. It was like how to become a proficient chanter in three months. Um, you know, one of the things I, I talked about was you have to put in the time. And I said an hour a day. You know, if you want to become a good chanter, you know, in three months, if you put in an hour a day of practice, you will get that. So, um, you know, this is for an intermediate level, but someone pointed out in the comments, you know, it's not just the time because you can really waste an hour of practice time if you're not doing um, good practice techniques. And I said, you know, you're right. Um, so in this video, I hope to cover a lot of those practice techniques that are going to help save you time. So, you know, starting off, I want to talk about a very important principle um, that one of my professors taught me. Um, he said, do it nice or do it twice. Now, I have, um, you know, to admit the context of this was not a musical context. It was a scientific context. You know, it's like get the experiment right the first time. That way you don't have to spend more hours in the lab. Um, now, with that, there's also implications about cost, you know, or money or even leisure. You know, if you're a musician, but you're also working a second job, you know, like if you are a chanter, you know, but not a full time chanter, for example, um, you don't have five hours a day to practice or five hours a day to spend with music. You might only have one or two hours a day, um, you know, and also if you spend more time on music, that might sacrifice time with your family. It might sacrifice, you know, time that you could be working overtime. It could sacrifice time of just relaxing and leisure because although music is fun, you know, I'd say it's anything but relaxing at some time. Sometimes it can be really intense and, and causes, you know, a lot of concentration to be needed. So as a result, you know, finding how to make your practice time as efficient as possible is really going to help you um, become a musician faster without having to spend so many hours and sacrifice so much from your life. So, um, with that being said, I'm going to show you a couple of practice techniques that are hopefully um, will save you time and help you get things right the first time around. So the first thing I want to talk about is slowing down with music. So, you know, I've been doing music for many years now at this point, and a lot of my, um, you know, practice habits from when I was younger were kind of, oh, I got to go fast. If I don't get it fast right, you know, I'm not smart enough for this. You know, a lot of that, it's the ego talking. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I can read this music well enough. I'm just going to sight read it in one go and just, you know, let it be. Now, you know, looking back, that's a very stupid way to practice. Because guess what? You make a mistake, go back, redo it. Make a mistake, go back, redo it. Make a mistake, go back, redo it. Versus going slow and getting it right the first time around. So I'm going to show you guys how to approach music um, slowly enough so that you can understand it the first time around. That way you don't have to keep going back and redoing and redoing and redoing it. So the first thing is the tempo. Now, one of the things I recommend for um, tempo is choosing one that is stable enough, you know, not too fast, not too slow, that you can practice without having to stop because it's too fast or feel like you have to rush or, you know, push a little further because it's kind of dragging too much. So one tempo I recommend is about 50 beats per minute. Now, why 50 beats per minute? I think that, at least in my experience, it's slow enough that you can process all the sound that you're hearing and all the you know notes you're seeing and all the words you're seeing. But it's um, so that you, that's you know that's the whole point of the slow tempo you know to process all that. So it's slow enough to process that, but it's fast enough to keep you going. You know, so 50 beats per minute is my recommendation. So you can get a metronome app on your phone or on your computer, and you know, and that's gonna work for you. So you know that's the first thing. Um, and now let's actually look at music and look at how can we apply. Um, some layering. So when you're learning music, it's not just getting the notes or the rhythms right and just, you know, moving along. It's a lot of things. It's, yeah, of course, the rhythms and the pitches, but also the phrasing and the interpretation and the text. Um, and we're going to talk about how can you use those to your advantage to learn music quicker. So you now here I have the hymn, Lord, I've Cried. It's uh, in first mode. Now I chose this hymn um, because it's a, about an intermediate hymn. Uh, it's not too difficult, um, but it's also not easy. So let's start from the beginning. So 
we have um, you know quite interesting rhythms here again if you're a beginner this might look intimidating if you are advanced you might say what are you talking about this is easy but it doesn't matter we're gonna look at it and look at what are the wrong methods and what are the good methods for practicing so starting here so pa if I were to sing this, you know, A to Z just by sight reading it, you know, let's say I'm a beginner chanter, I might do like this. Lord, I have cried unto thee, hearken unto me. Something like that. You know, I didn't get any of those notes right, and I just kind of guessed it. But I got to hear, you know, like, oh, I got that right. That's not going to work, you know. What we have to do is start by figuring out the layers of the music. Now, if you are like, okay, I can read most of this music. Okay, fine. But if you're not able to read most of this music and you're finding that, okay, I need some time to break things down, how do you break things down? So let's, you know, let's start with, with what we have down here. You know, this section here, you know, for me, I don't care. This, this is nothing crazy hard. But for beginning, you know, I see this, like, there's a zo. What is Zo gonna mean for me? And that you know, oftentimes you might find that a little bit um, scary. Now, I don't think you should be scared of your music, um, but you should respect the music, and that's what we're gonna do now. We're going to respect it by trying to analyze it and understand it. So, you know, what I like to do is isolate the hard section, and we're going to just rewrite it. Now, um, I'm gonna write a little bit neater than that, but the whole point of this is we're going to figure out the rhythms by themselves. And then after we figure out the rhythms by themselves, figure out the pitches and then put them together. And then we're going to figure out, you know, after we get those and we figure them out and they're more stable, how do you phrase them correctly to match um, what's happening? Because oftentimes people neglect that. They neglect the actual music making part, which is not what we want to do, you know? Um, if we add the music making part in with the learning part, then um, it sticks much, much better. Um, let's go and put everything in. So a couple things you might note. This Iporoi, I broke it down into the two apostrophe and I play, so there's a couple things. One, I place the Gorgon exactly where it belongs. And then the other thing is that it really does show where each individual note is so we can give each one the rhythm it deserves. So. Starting with this, the first note is two beats long. The next one's one and a half. The next one's half. Let's see if I can move it. I guess I can't. This is a third. That's a third. That's a third. And then that's two beats. So let's let's move that a little bit so it's a little bit clearer. So this is the rhythm. So one thing you can do is try clapping the rhythm or counting it. So you can be like, like on da for example. Da, 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 da. That's when we could do it. Or you can clap it like. Mm. So we figured out the rhythm. Now here's the thing. Do we do any guesswork? Zero guesswork. We got it right the first time around. Why? Because we went slow and made sure to break it down to understand it. Now, do you have to write everything out? No. But if you have a difficult section and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. This often helps to write things out and really make sure you isolate the rhythms. Now, as you get more advanced, you might be able to just break them down in your head. You know, that's a, um, a skill that takes some time. But when you're starting off, this might help to just put things together. Next thing is parley. So starting here, va di va vu pa, starts on pa. Pa, it goes down one, ni. So, and then it goes up one. So I wrote that a little bit weirdly. Ni, zo, ke, zo. Okay. So this is the the pitches we have now. Now let's go and figure them out. So you can either start with the rhythm, or you can just start with just keeping them as they are. It's like. Pa ni zo ni zo ke zo. So now we know kind of what's happening, what the rhythm, you know, the notes should sound like. Let's add the rhythms in. 
nizo nizo kezo. If you do it slowly, you can line them up much better. That way, again, you do it once and then it's perfect. So you look here, put everything together, and then you can add the words. Pa unto me. So we got that right. But let's say it's like, I'm okay, I got it right now, but how to memorize it? Well, think about the mood. You know, what does this sound evoke? You know, for me, this is not a happy sound. It's not a sad sound. I often find diatonic on Zo to be more of a mysterious sound. So let's try shaping it in a way that brings out that mysterious element. Mm -hmm. We'll start from the ga here. Hearken on to me. I think maybe we can practice it like that maybe once more an extra time. But for me, that really does help to solidify it. So already with that little section, we've talked about already just starting slower and breaking ideas down. Um, and that already, you know, although, yeah, you can say this took 10 minutes to get or five minutes to get. Well, in reality, um, it only took that long because I talked through it. But then once you figure out a process for breaking things down, maybe you don't have to write as much anymore. But once you figure out this process, you'll realize that you're not only learning things faster, you know, you don't have to go back and do them again, but now you're learning things more accurately. And then these theses that, you know, these musical phrases, you're going to find that there's other patterns in the music that are going to apply to it. So, you know, let's look at another example. So we get to this section. This is another hard section. Why? There's a huge mood, uh, mood switch. There's a difficult set of rhythms. And interpretationally, you know, you can do a lot with it. So same thing here. We can look here. Now, rhythmically, let's say you're not challenged by it. You see something like this. Ga, 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 ni, zo, kem. That's not the hard part. But that's a part that musically is going to be more difficult. So what we're going to do is kind of separate them a little bit. And then what I like to do then also is then kind of connect the phrases together. So we can see that this phrase has two sections. You have the first one to the ke, and then the ke to the ga. That's really how the phrase is happening. You know, whenever you're practicing things phrase by phrase and breaking things down, um, you don't want to stop at the end of the phrase. You want to actually start uh, stop one note past it. That way you can put ideas together a little bit better. Um, so in this case, there's two phrases. Or I guess phrase fragments that make up the whole phrase. That's the first fragment. And the second fragment Da, 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 da. We're going to go in and break this down. So using that same method as before, you know, and again, you can get faster at it. You might have a notepad app. You might, you know, have just a piece of paper on the side. You know, I'm just doing it directly here, but again, breaking this down. And then you have this section. Again, break this down. Make sure you get the order right. So make sure that the kedimata is where it should be. You know, it's either on the bottom or top. Make sure you accommodate that. And then add the timing. So here we have one and a half. We have half. And then we have quarter, 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 half, half, two. So looking at that rhythm, let's do the same thing as four. If we clap it out, or da, 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 da. So that's what the rhythm is. Um, and then if we add, you know, part of lead to it, we get this. Um, the ga, ke, the ga, wu, ga, the ga. So that, that's it. So that, let's, you know, first figure out the pitches. Okay, we figure out the pitches. Now let's add it through the rhythm, but slow. Now, 
let's add the music, you know, the notes in, um, sorry, the text in, but a little slower. So, to thee. So guess what? We figured out that, again, no guesswork. We did it, um, you know, correctly the first time around, so we didn't have to guess to figure it out. Now let's look at a couple things. Um, let's look at, there's another element we haven't talked about yet, diction, we'll add that in as well. So let's add the phrasing here. So the mood here. When I cry unto thee. You know, this is not a heavy melody. It's not a heavy section. It honestly has more of a sense of longing to it. Um, if anything, you know, this is, you know, I wouldn't say it's sad, but it's not joyous. No, I'd say longing is it. So how do you make it have the sound of something that's longing or the mood of something longing? Well, let's see if we can connect the God to knee here with, you know, and get this knee with some, some nice lightness on it. So it's not so heavy, but we don't want it to be so light that it's not, you know, I guess even pronounced. So you no, know, there's a couple things you can do a bit of playing around, experimenting, but you know, figure it out. So hmm. when I cry unto thee, you know, that's one way to do it. You can do a bit more heavy. When I cry unto thee, you know. Figure out what you want to do and make sure that it makes sense. Don't just do it out of the blue. You know, make sure that you also set it up with the phrases beforehand. But for now, this is just, again, adding the mood so you understand what you're doing musically. If you don't understand what you're doing musically, the music's not going to make sense to you. So then after we add that in there, um, let's talk about diction. So I already made a video about how to pronounce words when singing. Again, a lot of chanters get diction very wrong. Um, they sing it either too heavily or they don't make it understandable. Um, you know, in reality, the basic rule of thumb is you open to the vowel and don't close to the consonants. And you don't have to over accent consonants or enunciate consonants. Like the word Lord, the way that you pronounce it for singing is Lord, like L-A-W-D. Like, oh, Lord. You don't really pronounce the R that much. Same thing here. When I cry... The I on cry or I is not I, it's ah. And when you go to the next syllable, the yeah will just come in at the end. When I cry, I didn't say I, I said ah, but closing to the C on cry made the E come out. When I cry on, same thing there. That switch from ah to ah creates the E sound. Cry on to thee. And then, of course, you know, technically, you might have some challenges like the runs here. Again, you might have to take it a little slower and separate, you know, with your air those notes. The. If you need some help with them. Again, the idea with the runs is not about hammering them, but it's about building them into the phrase. To the. If you give them shape, they're much easier to sing. So. Again, those are some things of how do you practice efficiently. And again, it's not just getting the notes and rhythms right. Um, I don't know about, about you guys, but I've heard so many times, you know, not just in Byzantine, but other, you know, musicians and they play. Technically, their music is fantastic, but musically, their music has a lot to be desired. Um, a lot of chanters, they'll sing, and yeah, maybe the music's right, but it's not... Uh, speaking to the person listening. It's kind of just there. You know, the whole point of adding all the phrase musicality and all these interesting things is to make the music come alive. And, you know, the music no longer is just notes and rhythms, but it becomes something that, you know, transcends its material nature. In this case, material nature is just the notes on the, on the page. So, um, again, don't forget this. So, again, practice slowly and don't, you know, you know, I guess um, maybe just to be politically incorrect, you know, don't bullcrap the notes. You know, you want to make sure that every note is accurate. Now, when you add ornaments to things and things like that, you know, make sure that even then the ornaments are correct. You know, of course, there's liberties and ornaments, but there's 
a standard oral tradition that, you know, if you haven't learned yet, you know, learn by listening to other chanters, you know, or listening to recordings either in Greek or Arabic or, you know, good English recordings um, of authentic Byzantine chant, because that will help you learn all of those ornaments. So, um, you know, using this technique, you can apply it to, you know, basically everything from the easiest hymns to the hardest hymns. And this will really help you, uh, you know, project your singing and really, you know, propel your chanting to a much more advanced level. So let me just, you know, see if I can fix that. Yeah. So, you know, overall, the whole point of practicing um, is to get better. You know, my philosophy, not just for music, but for everything. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. You know, you know, if you're not at the gym lifting weights and you take off a month, guess what? You're probably getting worse. Again, if it's rest or recovery and you have an injury, that's different. But again, you lose that consistency, you're going to get weaker. Guess what? If you're not getting better at chanting, if you're, you know, not listening back to yourself and learning how to improve from your, you know, listening back to your recordings, you know, you're getting worse as a chanter. You know, if you are learning bad habits from other chanters and you're not listening back saying, oh, I actually don't like how that sounds. That sounds kind of ugly. If you're not going back and, re you know, reflecting on your own voice and your own recordings and you, you know, you're going to get worse. You know, I've heard some chanters that I were, I was kind of impressed with when I first met them. And then, you know, after hearing them after a couple of years, it's just they're not as good as they once were. Again, it's because they're not um, working to improve. When you're practicing, the whole point is getting better. And, you know, there's... Uh, there's a more, almost a spiritual element to this, you know, if you are not, you know, working on getting better and you think that you're good at music, you think you're a good person, you think that you are, you know, done growing, guess what? You're done growing and you're going to shrink. That's not a good mindset. The mindset is, okay, I'm good, might be okay, but I have a lot to learn. I have a lot to grow from. So, you know, whether you are a beginner chanter, advanced chanter, immediate chanter, or, you know, master put up Celtics, you should never be satisfied with, oh, I'm good enough. It should always be, you know, I have room to improve. I have places to learn. You now, this keeps you humble. It keeps you, you know, from you know, the worst thing that happens to, you know, musicians is that they, you know, get they get cocky and they start saying, oh, I'm the best of the best. I need to get better. Well, guess what? You realize that, oh, I've maxed up my potential. Guess what? The only place from, you know, from here is that up. It's either you stay the same. And nobody wants to say the same. They want to get better. Or you go down. And you don't want that. So, again, I hope you found this video helpful. Again, my beginner's business in chant course, um, you know, will be this fall. I'll be covering a lot of, you know, practice techniques. As well as singing technique, because it's very important um, for Byzantine chant. Um, uh, and all that is going to be in my class. So, if you're interested, the link to sign up will be down below. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one. And have a great day.